Hello and welcome. So far in our hypothesis testing journey, we have seen that most of the tests require some assumption to be satisfied. And two such assumptions which have consistently appeared in almost all the tests were the assumptions related to normality and the assumptions related to homogeneity of variances. Now, if you notice, an assumption itself is a hypothesis. So interestingly, to check these assumptions, we have separate hypothesis tests. Talking about the assumption of normality, we have multiple tests, but we'll be talking about a particular test today, which is known as the Shapiro test. We may not want to get too much into the math behind it, because that will be a little out of scope, but we should at least understand what does it try to do. So in Shapiro test, the null hypothesis is that the sample belongs to a normally distributed parent population. And the alternative hypothesis is that the sample doesn't belong to a normally distributed parent population. How are we going to decide? Well, it's the same. So we're going to compare the p-value obtained after running the test with alpha, or level of significance, which is typically 5%. If our p-value is greater than alpha, then we will say we'll go with the null hypothesis. If our p-value is less than alpha, then we will reject the null hypothesis. Similarly, for the homogeneity of variances, we have multiple tests, but we'll be talking about a test that's known as the Levine's test. The null hypothesis in this case is that all samples belong to populations with equal variance. Notice that Levine's test would typically be performed when you have multiple samples, or at least two samples. And the alternative hypothesis in case of Levine's test is that at least one sample has its variance different from the rest. Once again, to decide, we have to compare it with the level of significance. If nothing is stated, we will assume it to be 5%. So if p-value is greater than 5% or 0 0.05, we'll say all samples belong to populations with equal variance. But if not, our p-value is less than 0 0.05, then we'll say at least one sample has its variance different from the rest. Now, towards the end of this video, we'll also discuss what are our options when these assumptions are not satisfied. But let's just understand this conceptually. So let's say we have a distribution. It is not a perfect bell-shaped curve, as you can see, but looks more or less like a bell curve. Now, to visually ascertain if this actually follows a normal distribution, there is a specific kind of plot which is known as the quantile-quantile plot. A quantile in statistics is basically a measure that talks about dividing the data into equal parts. So if I say I want to derive a quartile, which is dividing the data into four equal parts. Now, you know that normal distribution exhibits certain characteristics. We want to take that as a reference and try to compare it with a sample. Does a sample exhibit the characteristics of a normal distribution? If so, then this line that you see here, this red line, is something that represents the ideal quantiles. And if your sample is clearly overlapping, these blue dots that you see here, if, if these are clearly overlapping with this red line, then you can say that your sample distribution is nearly normal. Notice it may not perfectly overlap, but it should not also show a lot of deviation. So in this case, if you see sample quantiles against the theoretical quantiles, the way the data is supposed to be distributed, it's nearly overlapping. However, if the sample data to begin with was not normally distributed, you can see this is a skewed distribution. It has an extended tail to the right. What would a quantile plot for this one look like? Well, you can see there is a deviation here. The quantiles are not the same as the quantiles you'll get, or these blue dots, as you can see, are not very well overlapping, especially at the ends. They're not overlapping very well with this red line, which is supposed to be the ideal distribution line. So one way is to conduct a test. The other way is to visually inspect or graphically inspect. What is best? Well, it will be best if you do both together. For example, I'm showing you both the quantile plots again. I'll show you how to perform the test later, but let me show you the test results in these two cases. So in the first case, if you see, the p-value that we obtained for Shapiro test is 0.89, which means we failed to reject the null hypothesis. And what was the null hypothesis? The sample belongs to a normally distributed parent population. We failed to reject it. However, in the second case, the p-value is zero. So it is definitely less than 0 0.05, which means we will have to reject the null hypothesis. Moving on to discuss the variance aspect of it, we are comparing two samples for their variance. So these two distributions look fairly comparable to me when we talk about variance, which is nothing but a measure of how far these points are, points on the curve are, from the mean. 
These look pretty similar. The means, of course, differ. The mean of the blue distribution is here somewhere, and the, the mean for the other distribution is here. So their means are not overlapping, but in terms of their shape, which is what the variance determines, they look pretty similar to me. Now, on purpose, what we have done is we have reduced the variance of the first distribution. When we reduce the variance, what happens is these points should come closer and the curve would look a little steeper. I'm talking about something like this. So what has happened? In this case, you can see the variance has reduced in case of this blue distribution. Of course, it looks different to you compared to the previous one because the scale has changed. Now, the same thing can be checked through a hypothesis test as we discuss Levine's test. Once again, the test statistic for these tests is not that meaningful for us be it Shapiro test for normality or be it Levine's test, because a test statistic is useful only if you're able to compare it to a critical value. And the critical value in general would require you to have a table with you, typically the tables that you have at the back of the books. So if you don't have that, all you have to do is you have to follow a p-value rule. Take the p-value and compare it with the threshold, which is 0 0.05 if nothing else is specifically stated. If the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, we'll go with the null hypothesis. What was the null hypothesis in case of Levine's test? The null hypothesis was all samples come from populations with equal variance. So in this case, looks like they're similar. However, in this case, it is less than 0 0.05. The p-value is less than 0 0.05. So we will have to reject the null hypothesis. Variance-wise, these two distributions are not similar anymore. Please note in this case, you should not be comparing them on the y-axis. This height in these two charts is not one and the same. It's very, very different. In general, when you reduce the variance, the curve would shrink towards the mean and it'll become steeper. And if it is untouched, it'll remain one and the same. All right, so we are here in Python and we are going to perform the test that we just discussed in Python. Unfortunately, these are not so conveniently available in Excel, so Python would be the best place to check it. In order to do anything in Python, we typically need to call libraries. So I'm calling a library called Numerical Python. I'm calling a library called Pandas to be able to read CSV or Excel files if that's needed. And two libraries for visualization, matplotlib and seaborn. I'm calling a library called stats model, which provides us the function for qqplot and the famous scipy library, which has all the functions related to hypothesis testing. We've already used it a couple of times. This time we'll be needing it for Shapiro and Levine. So let me run this. Now for this particular exercise, I'm generating some data which is normally distributed, but generating it randomly. The problem with that is that when I rerun my code, I may end up getting a slightly different data because it was a random generation. So in order to fix this, we typically set up a seed value here. Any number that you want to put here, you can try that. It would just ensure that every time that you read on this, you'll get the same result or anybody who runs your code will get the same result. We are generating two samples, sample one and sample two. Both are normally distributed. And in fact, they are standard normal distributions because their mean is zero and standard deviation is one. Their sample size is 30. Let me run this. This would have generated these two samples. Now let's check the QQ plot for the first sample. Uh, this comes from the method called QQ plot, which we're getting from the stats model library. Let me run this and you can see the QQ plot, right? So this is a limited sample. We had about 30 observations only, but this looks decent. To further clarify, we'll of course perform a Shapiro test, right? But before that, let's also visualize the sample two. So sample two again looks like this. These are pretty close to the red line, which should have indicated an ideal theoretical distribution, normal distribution in this case. Now let's do a Shapiro test. So when you call the function for a Shapiro, it's going to ask for the sample as the input. Remember, a normality check would be done for each sample separately. So when you do this, it generates two outputs. First would be the test statistic, and the other would be the p-value. Since we are only interested in p-value right now, we are just going to store it as the p-value, and we are going to print it, round it to three decimal places to see how the p-value is. Let's check if these samples are normally distributed. So the first p-value is 0.687. And the second p-value is 0.913. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis was that the data is normally distributed. Both the samples are normally distributed. No wonder because while generating the sample itself, we had put the condition that this should be normally distributed. Coming to the second test, which is about the comparison of their variances. As of now, if you notice, when we gave the input for the random sample, we suggested the standard deviation should be one. 
squared standard deviation is variance, right? So as of now, it should ideally show me that the variances are equal. Once again, we have the Levine's function here where we have to pass both the samples. If you have more samples, you can pass more samples. And what is it that you're checking the variation around? We are checking it around the mean. So let's check the p-value. And if I run this, I get a p-value, which is 0.645. The null hypothesis was that the samples have come from populations with equal variance. In this case, since the p-value is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So the samples indeed seem to have come from parent populations with equal variance. But let's just for experiment, go back and change the first distribution's standard deviation to 0.5. Now, if you see, the square of this will be 0.25, where the square of the second sample would be 1. Squared standard deviation is variance, right? So let's rerun this here. I've just changed that sample here. And let me come back and rerun the Levine's test only and see what happens. Now you see the p-value has gone to zero. Earlier, this p-value was greater than 0 0.05. Now it's less than 0 0.05. Of course, we've induced the variances in such a way that they are different now. And Levine's test is able to detect this. So generally, these are the tests that you will always perform before you perform any conventional test. What if the assumption of normality is not satisfied? Then we have a separate set of tests known as non-parametric tests, and those will be covered in our future videos. But now we just wanted to discuss these two major assumptions. I hope you get some clarity on it. Thank you.